if you're wondering. Um, Matthew chapter 10, and this is part of what I guess we would call a series of modern missions. This is part five, <clears throat> and I would subtitle it The Convert's Conviction. And I imagine you, like most people, have some type of conviction. Maybe you have political convictions. Maybe you have, you should, as a Christian, have certain theological convictions. And more than likely, over time, your convi convictions may have modified a little bit. You know, I used to think that, I don't know, your hair should only be this short and now it's okay if it's this long or whatever. And some convictions are significant, some are relatively foolish, you know, whatever. Um, but, but usually people have some kind of, of conviction. And maybe it's theological what day you should worship or what day you should not or things like that. Generally speaking, a, a conviction um, is not something, not necessarily a hill you will die on. But we do have theological truths that go farther than a mere conviction. Things that we will die for, things that we will stand on and for. Some are very significant, and today's one of them. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm still <coughs> coughing from um, COVID. So, I mean, I don't have COVID. And I'm, <laughs> if so, I'd be like the longest lasting COVID person ever. Um, but, you know, I think doctor told me here yesterday, and it's like six months, you know, you might have that cough, so please forgive me. But I want to give you a proposal this morning, and that is that the disciple of Jesus Christ is convinced of him and his message. They're convinced of who and quite honestly what he is. And I don't mean to make that out like an inanimate object because he's a who, but he is a something also. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of Man. Things like that. In Matthew chapter 10, I want to use verse 33 to kind of move us into the next section, which begins in verse 34. But this is pertinent, I believe. So Jesus says at the end of the last section, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, you know, that's not necessarily weird. <laughs> but a, a mother and a father... And, you know, and a mother, a, a dad and, a, and his son, yeah, that's a little different. And Jesus says in verse 36, a person's enemies will be those of his own household. How strange is that? Whoever loves father or mother, now we're getting to the crux of the matter, more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. As far as I'm concerned, this, this text in its offensiveness and strangeness is right up there with John 6 when Jesus says, drink my blood and eat my body. Because when he said that, a lot of people, they turned and went away because this was a hard saying. And Jesus said to his disciples at that point, will you go away also? And, but their, their response then, and, and what should be here, and what I, I think what our response should be is, where are we going to go? 
You have the words of life. So I want to address this text a little bit this morning. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on it, and then we'll dig into it. Father, we do thank you for your word. This text is, is to a degree and in a sense very difficult. It is very offensive to, to us as humans who love our children and our parents. Yet, you teach us here a significant truth. You will not have other gods before you. So this really harkens back to what you told um, Israel in the Exodus, after the Exodus. It really goes back even to the garden when Adam and Eve could not put something good to the eyes, something that seemed to share some aspect of life before you. That message is still the same. You are God. And besides you, there is none other. No matter how close they are to us, no matter how much we love them, there is but one God. And it is, it's our conviction that you are him. Help us to learn from this text this morning, Father. Give us the necessary conviction for your honor and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me, forgive me, but before I forget a third time, um, a little intermission here um, tonight. Um, after the business meeting, we have food over there in the fellowship hall. So if, um, if you want to participate in cake and cookies and all kind of goodies like that, lemonade, join us over there after the business meeting. Intermission over. Two weeks ago, I asked you, um, what do you fear? What do you fear most? And I imagine you thought about that. I told you what I fear. Um, this week, I wanna ask you a similar question, and that is, who or what do you love, like most? Now, <clears throat> you can give the pious answer, which might be right. I love God above all things, all, all people. Well, that would be the right answer. The, the question that you really have to decide is, is, do you really mean that? And you should really think hard about this. I mean, you should really think about this. Because knowing that it's the right answer, saying it as the right answer, and meaning it as the right answer are not the same thing. And there may come a time where you are called on to demonstrate who you love most. These guys did. Maybe you won't, maybe you will. But the two are connected. Who do I fear most and who do I love most? I'll just bring out three points to you real quick this morning. Number one in verse 34, we have a, a surprising revelation as to why Jesus came. And I say it's a surprising revelation because, you know, if, if, if you were to, if someone were to ask you, well, why did Jesus come? Well, you, know, you might start off with to save sinners. But then if somebody said, well, give me some other biblical reasons, you might say some things, and we'll list some here in just a second. But <clears throat> one of the things you would not say, likely, is um, to, to, to divide families to cause fathers and sons to be divided. You probably wouldn't say he came to bring a sword. No, he came to save, he came to bring peace. That's, that's how we think, but this is right out of his own mouth. And we have to consider that. And we have to put it in context and we will. 
some common misunderstandings. And, and, and it's not that they're not true. It's just that they're not all, the only truth. Some of the things that are true that we, that we focus on are, for example, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Mighty God, Everlasting uh, Father, Prince of Peace. We think about him like that, and quite honestly, that's true. That's, that's who Jesus is. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, Zechariah says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. And that's true later on. But before that peace comes, there's going to be a lot of division. You should understand that and accept that and be prepared for that because it's coming. If asked why Jesus came, some of the reasons people would give is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. You don't, we won't read all these just for time's sake. And that is to do God's will. Well, he definitely did do God's will. To seek and to save. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. Jesus came to call sinners to salvation. He definitely did do that. To save sinners, of whom Paul said, I am the chief. 1 Timothy 1, 15. To minister to people. Matthew 10, 28. We saw, uh, 20, 28. We saw that. We'll see that later on. To spend, But to send a sword, as we see in this text, to, to divide people, to make variance between them. That's usually not on the top of our list of things that Jesus came to do yet. It's what he just said. So we can't deny that. What we need to understand is that Jesus' peace is to those who receive him. Those who do not receive him as the God, as the Messiah, as the propitiation, as their Savior, the Bible says are still in rebellion against him. That's their deportment. It's not this. It's this. So to those who submit, he brings peace. I, I wonder what Jesus' return would be like if, if he just kind of like showed up on earth today. I'm not talking about the second coming or the rapture or, you know, preview to the tribulation or anything like that. But what if he just, if he came today, I wonder how Christians would receive him. Because honestly, and, and I mean, I do, I watch these things. I mean, I'm a pastor. I, I read this stuff. Da, 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 da. It's my world. Um, and I, I hear what people are saying out there. I'm watching at least some of Christianity, Western Christianity for the most part. And I hear about Jesus being love, and he is love. I mean, 1 John makes it very clear God is love. I think he says at least two times, maybe three. Chapter two, four, I can't remember. Um, Jesus loves and he came to seek and save that which lost all that stuff we talked about a while ago. Yep, amen. But so much so, I wonder if the divisive Jesus showed up with conviction about who he actually is if it would be an offense to many Christians today. I'm, I'm really pretty sure of that. Because we don't like this side of Jesus. We want the loving side, the patient side, the merciful side. Well, what about the just side? You can't have peace without justice. It, it just doesn't happen. Somebody's got to 
throw in the white towel. Somebody's got to submit. And because he's God, the impetus to submit is on us, not on him. We don't come to God on our terms. We come to God on his terms. I believe Jesus would be met with hostility among even many of the converted people. This is a side of Christianity because we're so evangelistic today, and we should be, that, that we don't share with people. It's like John 3, 18. He that believes on him is not condemned. He that believes not is condemned already because he hath not believed and the only begotten Son of God. So we don't mind getting in front of people saying, look, if you, you, know, you need to get saved because God loves you and he's patient and he's merciful he's kind and he's a good God and he's got heaven you know, and all this. You know, we're good to go with that, but then part of us on that evangelistic message kind of wants to slow down a little bit when we, say, when we think about saying, but if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. That's very uncomfortable. This doesn't roll off the tongue. It sounds mean. It sounds hateful. John 3.18 is a very merciful text. I'm going to be honest with you. When I got saved and I was 17 years old, I wish I loved Jesus like I'm supposed to. You know why I got saved? I mean, I believed the gospel as best I could at 17 when you're an idiot. You know, I wasn't raised in church, so I don't know. You know, I came to this thing fresh and new. You know why I got saved? I didn't want to go to hell. I mean, I believed it as best I could, but I didn't want to go to hell. That last part of John 3, 18 sticks with me. But I'm grateful for the love part. I really am. That love part warns me from the hell part. Amen? Amen. God's gospel is costly. The price so high that in order to emphasize this truth, Jesus gives, secondly, a practical illustration. And this illustration, I think, would be very helpful for us. We find it in verses 35 and 36. Jesus says, I came to set a man against his father. Now, if you just stopped right there and that's all you knew about what Jesus said, what would you think? Why would, why would you want to make a man mad at his dad? That doesn't make sense. And a daughter against her mother. And a daughter against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemy should be of their own house? I mean, honestly, that's all you knew. It doesn't sound like a very benevolent God, does it? But there's a lot of truth to the story. Jesus came to divide homes. And I want to be careful to reinforce some truths here. Number one, um, God's first institution is the family. Before the church... Before a law, a legal system, Moses, civil law, later, was the family. God is in the family. Husband, wife, and if he allows, gives kids. That's the biblical monogamous model. That's the way it's supposed to work. Anything contrary to that is not the biblical model. Now, sometimes things happen, you know, a spouse dies or, you know, whatever the case, that's, that's, you know, that's a different story. We can't get into every type of scenario. But I think you understand the idea. If you're not, read Ephesians um, chapter 5. It'd be a good place to start. The point is God instituted the family and he supports the family. And then go back to Exodus chapter 20. We find it very clear that God wants, we talked about this last week, for families to honor mothers and fathers. It's very clear. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Micah chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, 
It says the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah's siding with God, not family. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Um, I'll wait because it, it'll fit later. But families, I love families. The enemy is within, potentially, verse 36. And if you have a, I'll just tell you, if you have a family that is godly, where maybe everybody in it's converted, everybody is at peace, um, you have a wonderful thing. One of the most painful parts of my day, just about every day, and I'm just being honest with you, is when I, when I look through like Facebook or some social media and I see these wonderful families and I praise God for them. But like, I don't have that. I feel the sting every time I see the video with the young soldier coming home and hugging his dad because they love each other. Quite honestly, it hurts me. I don't want to watch it. But I'm really glad for those people. But everybody doesn't have that. I don't have that. So if you have that, praise God, don't let it go. Nourish it. But always protect truth before even that. That's conviction. Why would there be an enemy within the family? Because Christ came to divide. The truth of who he is and what he is does divide families. I feel it in my family. Any person that is not for Christ, hear this simply, is against Christ. There's no middle ground. If you are not for Christ, you are against Christ. If your son or your daughter or your mother or your father or your grandparents are not for Christ, they are against Christ. That's not my words. Those are Jesus' words. He came to bring the sword, not Dale. Please understand that. And it's got to be the right way because God doesn't do anything wrong. Right? Correct? I want to try to break down this last section a little bit. The breakdown works this way. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus' words. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me. Once, though, we see the suitableness, and that's the idea for worthy there, suitable. Once we see the suitableness, the compatibility of and how deserving Jesus Christ is, we will want to follow him. We will want to be submissive to him. So it looks like the problem within the family is not that you don't love your children or that your children don't love you, but we don't love Jesus for who he is fully the way we're supposed to. I want to share something with you. And this is a problem Dale Gooding has, okay? I'm just being honest with you. Um... <clears throat> I, I was adopted when I was three, so I don't know if, if like, you can have a kid that, you know, you, you brought into this earth, and, and you feel something for them. I feel that for my son and daughter, but I honestly don't know if, if like, as, as a parent, I don't know 
if I feel for the people who raised me what, I, what, what your children probably feel for you. I, don't, I mean, it might be, but I don't know it because I was adopted. So I always wonder. I, I don't know if I really know familiarly what other people feel as love, and that bothers me. And one of the reasons it bothers me is because I wonder how that translates into my family, into my God. So Dale Gooding wonders, is what I feel as love for God right? Is it what you feel as a saved person? This bothers me. I mean, I live in this turmoil every day of my life, and I just turned 55 last week. Now, I know who my biological mother is. She died uh, two years ago. I have no feelings for her. None. I mean, you know, just, and if my sister's watching, nothing personal. I just don't. I, I think I found out this week who my father is. I mean, this time for sure. I think. But I, he's dead. Died in 86. I don't, I don't have any feelings for him. So I don't know if what I feel for my mom and dad who raised me is what you feel for your mother and father who raised you. So I wonder if what I feel for God, quite honestly, is what you feel for God. And I'll never know for sure because I can't get in you. Yesterday, I shared this with my D group and they really, they really just ministered to my heart with their, their um, help in, in understanding kind of where we're all at with this really helped me out a lot. And I'm grateful for my D2 group. And so we, we were talking about, you know, if, if, our love isn't necessarily this euphoric feeling all the time. Like you can be married to the love of your life and not always feel like you did at the altar. Right? I mean, sometimes you're mad, but you still love them. But you know that. That's how I have to accept by faith that I might have it right in loving God. But I'm at a deficit. Jesus, the Bible makes it very clear, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And I wonder, don't answer this, is there anybody here that has ever loved God for more than five minutes like that? And if, if there was even one person, I would be very discouraged because I haven't. I haven't. I've had highs where I felt very worshipful. I was just like in awe. I couldn't. Didn't know what to say. I've done that. But it's not 24-7, 365. It's probably not for you either. So these guys shared that with me yesterday. I was very encouraged by that. And I hope that if you're in the same condition, that is an encouragement to you as well. I told them, and I told my Sunday school class today, in John chapter 21... Jesus, and we talked about this before, Jesus is dealing with Peter. This is after the resurrection, right before Acts 1, the ascension. <clears throat> and, and he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. I can't remember. And then he asks him a second time, right on the tail of that. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my little lambs. And then he says a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. And I'm thinking, what kind of answer is that? So I did a little digging. Now, please forgive me for using the Greek because your Bible's sufficient, okay? Your English Bible's sufficient. But here's what Jesus asked Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me with an unconditional love? And that's the agape, and that's how God says we're supposed to love him. He says, Peter, do you love me with an agape love? You know what Peter's response was? Lord, I love you with a phileo love. 
Well, that's not what God demands. Hear me. God didn't demand that we love him with a phileo love, a brotherly love. That's where we get the word Philadelphia. He said, you love me with an agape love. But you got to give Peter an A for being honest. So Jesus gives him a, maybe a second chance. He says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, I phileo you. Now, the pressure's got to be on, Peter. You think he's saying, like, I know what you're looking for, so let me just tell you what you want to hear. Peter's honest. I appreciate Peter's honesty. In fact, I am nourished. I'm comforted by Peter's honesty. But there's more comfort in that text. Jesus says to him a third time, he says, Peter, do you phileo me? In other words, do you just love me like a brother? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know why that comforts me? Because I am like Peter. I don't love God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my might all the time. And Jesus seems to be okay with that. Jesus didn't say, well, we're going to have to find a new leader. We're going to kick you out of the group. Give me the keys back. He didn't do that. That... Now, take into consideration what I've been saying for the last 10 minutes. That comforts my heart. I, I know I don't love him like I should, but man, I want to. I'm trying to figure it out and better understand it. And I, I'm convinced by that situation with Peter that Jesus is okay with, with that. He knows that, to put it in Old Testament terms, I am but dust. How gracious and merciful is that when a God who deserves and is worthy of all of our love infinitely and commands us to give it doesn't condemn us when we can't and don't. I find comfort there. I hope that you do. Then Jesus said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Our following eventually does turn into a found life that is infinitely better than a current life. This is what a lot of Christians go through in the very beginning. Christ makes demands on us that we think we can't meet. But when we try to, what you'll find out, and young people especially, over the decades, what you realize is not only you can in his strength, but you start to understand why he demanded it and your ability, again, in his strength to do it. So don't quit because you think you can't. Because you can't. <laughs> you just keep trying. Just keep paddling. And then fourthly, lastly, Jesus said, whoever finds his life will lose and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's the revelation. Point is, Jesus is polarizing even within the closest of relationships. Jesus Christ can be polarizing. But our answer to this question and in this conflict must be based on our conviction of who Jesus is. Our answer will be then thirdly a testimony to the challenging and sobering application in verses 37 through 39. Whosoever loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whosoever does not take up his cross is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, find it. You know, if you're a scientist, you know what a litmus test is. A litmus test is a test of acidity that gives an obvious and usually pretty instant result. You can tell what a thing is by a litmus test. I want you to know there's a distinction here between worthy and worth. When Jesus uses these terms, 
Worthy is to be suitable, comparable, deserving of. Okay? This person is worthy of my love. They are not worthy of me. Worth is different, and we find this in the last two parts of this exchange or Jesus' presentation. Worth is finding life or losing it. To, to find is to get or to obtain. To lose is to destroy or ruin. It's where we get the word apollyon, apocalyptic, the end, complete destruction, gone. Simply put, to follow Christ Knowing to follow Jesus, knowing He is the Christ, is life, and that more abundantly. It's it's a hard life. I'm gonna just tell you, Christianity's hard. People say, "Oh, well, Christianity is for women and children." No, Christianity. If you have it real, if you really have it, and you act on it, it will be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. Because you are against you. The world is against you. The spiritual powers that be are against you. Everybody and everything is against the gospel. This is the hardest thing you'll ever do. We don't like this idea, though, because we want to go back to the nice Jesus. The love Jesus. The kind Jesus. And I'm not taking anything away from that. Don't misunderstand me. But let's just be honest about it. There are two sides to this coin. The, the only value we have is the value that God placed on us. That's it. That's all you got. You're nothing. You're nobody. You're not potent. You're not significant. You're not smart. You're not good looking. You're not, you're nothing. God could wipe you out right now and it never, it wouldn't blink an eye. It wouldn't be an injustice on his part. Except that he didn't keep his word, which I guess that would be a big deal. But he could. So what value did God place on man? What, what, what value does he have for you? The cross. The son. The infinite God-man. So the, the value that God has placed on his children is his son. Put it simply. For God so loved the world... That he did what? Help me out. All together now. He gave. He gave his son. What's more valuable than the son? That's the value. Now, understanding that value, understanding the personhood of Christ, there is nothing are no one who can compare or be worthy of more than him. Not even your parents. See how this circles back? Not even your son, not even your daughter, not even your spouse. Nobody can displace the value of the son. So for us... To love somebody or something more than Jesus is not an act of ego on his part. It's a demonstration that we are not idolaters. He's God. He has to be first. Or we're idolaters. God will have no gods before him. Not even our kids. Now, let me be honest with you. I've, I'm glad my children are older. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to maybe warn. 
I've seen this as a pastor. For, I've seen it way too many times. There'll be a theological conflict, a, a, a child will do something, you know, maybe have a different, a wrong theological belief or they'll commit a you know, heinous sin or whatever the case might be. And as a pastor, you're trying to fix the problem. But Johnny has got egg on his face. Okay? He's found out. Almost, and, and I'm not kidding, I wish I was. Almost every single time when it's side with theology or your child, do you know who the mamas will side with? The child. Well, Johnny would never do that. Well, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, per perspective. You know, I mean, I mean, all roads really do lead to heaven. So if Johnny's wrong on the deity of Christ, it's okay. God loves. You think I'm kidding. I've been here almost two years. You ought to know I don't kid on stuff like this. You, you know that by now, right? I'm not kidding you. You think Mrs. Smith won't take Johnny Smith's word over theology because she loves him? Most of the time she will. I'm not kidding. I wish. And I fear for that. Because as your pastor, I don't want you to have that conviction. I want you to have the conviction that Jesus is trying to get across here. He is the Christ. And you cannot love anybody, even a child, more than him. You can't. For me to say anything other than that is to deny, to deny this word. And I cannot do that. Don't do that. Worthiness is indicated by our love for God above <coughs> all else. <coughs> Worthiness is indicated by loyalty. So then lastly, we see Jesus' indictment here in verse 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will find it. It's an it's a indictment to some and it's an encouragement to others. Those who find Christ and find life, and it's an encouragement. But too many for too long, and even I see it today, have sanitized the cross. We've made this, and, and believing if Christ is calling is easy. I, I, I believe in that sense of easy believism, believism. But I don't believe the Bible teaches at all that all roads lead to God. They're not the same thing. So don't sanitize the cross. Don't deny, even if you don't fully understand, the deity of Christ. It, Christianity is our life. The gospel is our life. Our whole life. So it's not a piece of the pie. It's not a little here, little there. Taking up Jesus' cross is receiving Jesus Christ and following him regardless of the cost. I honestly, I just be honest with you, I, I, I'm very concerned in our day that we might be seeing a time where there is a, a lot of falling away. The pressure may get intense. I'm a premillennialist. I, you, may, you may not be, and that's okay. Whatever. But if I'm right, and we do see that kind of pressure coming on, you better be ready for it. And that's where I was, I was talking about earlier. You might be called out to answer to this sooner than you think. And you can give the pious, obvious answer, but do you really mean it, and will you pay the price for meaning it? That's what I want to help you do, prepare you for. Does that make sense? Yes. Being convinced that Jesus is the Savior um, is demonstrated in our belief in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Every time we take Lord's Supper, 
if we take it honestly, we are demonstrating our belief in this gospel that Jesus is God, that he came to earth in his humility, we call it his humility, he condescended to man, earthly things, he paid, became the price for man's sin, shedding his blood, having his body broken, dying on that cross, rejected by the Father, for three days, and then the Father being satisfied with that price paid, that propitiation, John talks about in First John, Paul talks about in Romans, mercy seat where all of God's wrath was poured out, God accepting Jesus' payment for it, resurrected him three days later, giving us life. So we're gonna take Lord's Supper today and when you take Lord's Supper, you, you are saying, I am testifying to, I am preaching the gospel of the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ, the God-man who paid the price for my sin. You're saying, I believe that. Mm 